Matt Cawthon. He's a fan favorite in the Wheel of Time book series. That's probably even an understatement, actually. Matt is like the fandom's overall favorite character, even if everybody is wrong because Nynaeve is clearly the best. But there's lots of good reasons why people love Matt. Today, we're going to talk about them. Join me today as we break down the top 10 Matt Cawthon moments from the Wheel of Time book series. Now, before we begin, smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you like Wheel of Time content. And spoilers. Duh. If you haven't seen one of my top 10 style videos before, I am incapable of just giving my opinion without creating some convoluted ranking system to help organize my thoughts. So I asked myself, what makes a moment great? And here's what I came up with. We'll be ranking these on first, meaning to the story. Did the moment have significant impact on the story as a whole and on Matt's arc? Second, we'll rank on how fun I think they are. Yeah, that's subjective, but get over it. It's my list and I'll rank each scene or moment that I thought was fun. Third, emotional weight. Some of the most impactful moments are also emotional. And last, we'll rank if the moment was a strong payoff on a long-term setup. The most satisfying moments in a series are the ones that are paid off to something that happened previously in the story. I'll give each one of Matt's moments a rank out of 40 and there's the list. So without further ado, let's get into it. Kicking things off with number 10. We'll kick off the list with a moment from the Dragon Reborn when Matt, with Jewel and Sandar, breaks into the Stone of Tear to rescue Egwene, Elaine, and Nynaeve. Of course, that's an oversimplification. He climbs on roof, he meets the Aiel, he uses fireworks to blow a massive hole in the side of the fortress, and then he rescues them, only be treated like he did something wrong. So let's break it down. In terms of meaning to the story, this is quite a bit more meaningful than you might believe on the surface. For one, if Matt doesn't rescue the girls, that would obviously have a significant impact on the plot for them. But also, Matt distracts the guards, blows a hole in the stone, which also allows the Aiel to capture the stone, which in turn helps Rand take Kalindor. And don't forget, he also used the fireworks, which gave him ideas for future uses for them, which would later turn into the dragons. Breaking into the Stone of Tear gets an 8 out of 10 for meaning to the story. And was the scene fun? Well, it sure was. Matt climbing around on buildings, fighting off defenders, and he's always just funny to follow. So seven out of 10 for fun. Emotional weight is where this one lags a bit. This wasn't an emotional scene, and really, other than his sense of duty to protect Elaine, Egwene, and Nynaeve at personal cost to himself, that's pretty on par with Matt's character, but that's really about it for emotional weight. So three out of 10 there. Last, in terms of a strong payoff, we're middle of the road here. The payoff wasn't necessarily breaking into the stone, but more Matt following through on his goal of saving them. I'll give it a five out of 10. In total, breaking into the Stone of Tear to rescue the Supergirls from Dark Friends gets a 23 out of 40 and the number 10 spot on my list. Coming in at number nine, we have Matt blowing the Horn of Valir and ending the Great Hunt. He is dying of his exposure to the Shadar Logoth dagger, or I guess more his separation from it. And they are surrounded on one side by the forces of the Shan Chan advancing on them. And then on the other side, the charging white cloaks. Completely surrounded and hopeless, Matt doesn't think too much and just blows the Horn of Valir calling forth the heroes of the horn, defeating the Shan Chan, and watching Rand fight Ishamael in the sky over Falm. This also ties Matt to the horn as the horn sounder, and we learn that the heroes of the horn are familiar with him, even if he isn't one of them. For more on the Horn of Valir, check out this video up here somewhere. I did a whole video on it, breaking it down. It's pretty cool. But from meaning to the story perspective, this one stands fairly high. Obviously, blowing the Horn of Valir saves the lives of our main characters, but it also defeats the Shan Chan temporarily. Matt also becomes tied to the horn. And even though that tie is later broken, it cements Matt's importance to the White Tower and to Dark Friend plots. Nine out of 10 for meaning. From a fun perspective, I wouldn't say this scene is written to be fun necessarily. It's more of a culmination, culmination of a prophecy and out of necessity. And while the battle is fun to watch, I'm not sure that it really comes from Matt being a fun character necessarily because all he does is blow the horn. That being said, the scene is written so well and the buildup is awesome. I will give it a six out of 10. There's not a ton of emotional weight in this scene in the book, especially for Matt. 
Again, it's not really written to be emotional. This is more of an action scene, and the only real emotions prior are those of hopelessness about what is to come, and the sense that there's a prophecy about to be filled. So I'll give it a three out of 10. Lastly, for strong payoff. This is both very true and not so much. Yeah, that doesn't make sense, but hear me out. There was foreshadowing that there would be something with prophecy that would come, especially with the five ride forth stuff from Varen. Additionally, the horn had been built up the whole book and some of it even in the first book. But there wasn't much foreshadowing that this would happen or that it would be Matt somehow blowing the horn. So I'll give it a six out of 10. In total, Matt blowing the horn of Valir in the book gets a 24 out of 40 and earns the number nine spot on my list. I should mention, however, that the show adaptation adds quite a bit more emotional weight to the scene for Matt's arc and had an arguably stronger payoff for Matt as a character. Not necessarily comparing the two scenes, but I'd say the way that it was done in the show would have likely landed this scene higher on my list if it had been done that way in the book. Number eight on my list brings, I think, not only one of my favorite Matt moments, but also one that I frequently see book fans mention as one of theirs, too. This scene comes in The Dragon Reborn, right after Matt is healed with, from his connection to the Shadar Logoth dagger, and he wakes up within the walls of Tarvalon. He has been recovering and was in a weakened state, and he wanders down to the Warder practice yards looking to try to make some money, and sees everybody gawking over Gawain and Galad and their swordsmanship, and the fact they have their shirts off. And Matt challenges them both at once, in a major bet and ends up soundly defeating both of them with a quarterstaff while they use swords. In terms of meaning to the story, this doesn't have much meaning other than to demonstrate that Matt is a character to be reckoned with. He's a badass. I'll give it a three out of 10. As for fun, that's where this scene truly shines. This is one of my favorite scenes to read and I look forward to reading it every single time I'm reading The Dragon Reborn. It's just fun to read. It's always fun to watch people get knocked down a peg or two and it's fun to watch Matt do it as he's always underestimated by people in the series. One of Matt's calling cards is that he is so much more than he seems on the surface and this is one of the first times that we truly see that in the series. 10 out of 10 for fun. As for emotional weight, this is not a terribly emotional scene, but it does carry some emotion to me in that we finally start to see Matt as a character that has some worth in the series. He was truly the last of the Emmonsfield group at this point to have something distinctive and powerful about his character. And this is where we first see it. So four out of 10 for emotional weight. Lastly, for strong payoff for the setup, this rate's fairly high. We've had two and a half books of Matt essentially being a funny tag along character who was not contributing much on his own. He didn't have special powers other than he was supposedly a Taviran, but we never saw it. And much of his character was defined by a dagger that made him very uninteresting to read compared to his Emin Sealed friends. This is where Matt finally starts to come into his own. And the reason this scene hits like it does is because all of the setup, or I should say lack of setup of his character to this point. So eight out of 10 for payoff. In total, Matt fighting and kicking Gawain and Galad's ass gets a 25 out of 40 and earns the number eight spot on my list. The Golam is one of the more disturbing villains in the series. It's almost invulnerable. It's superhumanly strong. It's out to kill our main characters, and there is almost no way to stop it. The fear that the Golam causes among our main characters, especially Matt, is high as he has to change where he sleeps and when, and he's always conscious that he is being hunted. All of this is why when Matt finally defeats the Golam, it is such a powerful moment. For meaning to the story, this is gonna rate really high. The Golam represents a major threat to all of our main characters, specifically Matt, who plays such a large part in the story. If the Golam were to successfully kill Matt or Elaine or anyone else, the Shadow wins. Seven out of 10 for meaning to the story. For fun, the plan and the way in which Matt disposes of the Golam is intricate. It's fun to watch it play out. The fight, the fires, the use of a skimming gateway, they're all ingenious ideas and it's fun to see. It wasn't as fun as something like Gawain and Galad getting their asses kicked, but it was still fun. I will give it a six out of 10 for fun. For emotional weight, this one goes a bit higher than you might think. Matt was living in a constant state of fear of the Golam. It had attacked his camp, it had killed his men, 
threatened Ulver, who was like a son to Matt, not to mention it, it was after his other friends too. The sense of relief of knowing that you're not being hunted by an unstoppable killing machine, that's palpable. I'll give it a six out of 10 for emotional weight. Lastly, for strong payoff, this gets a fairly high score. We had been watching these fights between Matt and the Golom play out over the course of a couple books. So finally seeing some resolution was fun. I'll give it a seven out of 10 for payoff. In total, Matt's defeat of the Golom gets a 26 out of 40 and earns the number seven spot on my list. With the number six spot on the list, we have Matt taking over the army in Kyrian. Up until this point, Matt was trying to get away from Rand. He wanted to get back to his own life. He wanted to escape the whirlwind of danger that came from being a companion to the Dragon Reborn. That being said, Matt's own Tavirin nature wouldn't allow him to leave. While trying to depart the Battle of Kyrian against the Shido, Matt comes across a whole company of Tyran and Kyrian and soldiers walking into what he can clearly see is a trap or an ambush by the Shido. Unable to let them die, Matt takes command of the army, defeats the Shido, and continues to win battles throughout the day, culminating culmination in a one-on-one -on -one clash with Kuladin himself, and then he kills the Shido leader. For meaning to the story, this rates highly as this is the beginning of Matt's military skills being on full display. It also starts the Band of the Red Hand as soldiers that Matt commands, and they end up pledging themselves to him and his private army continues to grow throughout the story, and it plays a pivotal role in the last battle. Also, without these successes, Matt would never have been trusted to lead the last battle in the first place. Nine out of 10 for meaning to the story. For fun, I love watching this scene as Matt takes charge against his better judgment. He is always the reluctant hero, and while he is outwardly always coming across selfish, he is anything but, as he always seems to do the right thing. It's one of my favorite parts about Matt as a character. I'll give this one an 8 out of 10 for fun. For emotional weight, the scene is more about Matt coming to terms with the fact that he is never getting away from the action. Outside of that, not overly emotional. 4 out of 10. Lastly, I wouldn't say this was totally set up to be a great payoff, but seeing the memories that were planted in Matt's head having a direct effect on his life was fun to see, and there was certainly a payoff around that. So I'll give it a 6 out of 10. In total, Matt taking over the army at the Battle of Kyrian gets a 27 out of 40, and it earns the number 6 spot on my list. Breaking into the top five, we have a moment that actually comes from someone else's viewpoint. A large part of Matt's storyline takes place in and around Ebu Dar when he meets and essentially kidnaps Tuon, primarily because she carries the title of Daughter of the Nine Moons. And the Finns told him that he would marry the Daughter of the Nine Moons. For most of the time that she is in captivity, she treats him like a foolish boy who doesn't know what he's doing. But when Matt and his party are finally reunited with the Band of the Red Hand, we get a very cool moment from Tuon's perspective. As Matt enters the camp, she sees the organization and capability of the fighting force. But most importantly, she watches Matt carefully. She sees how he takes charge, how the men choose to follow him, and she realizes that she has underestimated Matt completely. She thought that she had someone that could be easily controlled, and she realizes that she has followed a lion, and now that lion is on the loose. For meaning to the story, this rates highly only because of what it leads to. Tuan's view of Matt from here is what leads her to finally marry him, which in turn allows him to lead her forces in the last battle, which is fairly important. So I'll give it a 7 out of 10. As for fun, to me, this scene is quite fun. I love watching people's expectations get flipped and seeing somebody like Tuan, who had been so self-righteous before, have a change of perspective is quite fun. I'll give it a 7 out of 10. As to the emotional weight on the surface, it doesn't seem like there is any, but I think there's more than meets the eye here. This is part of Tuan falling for Matt. In her way, I think when she realizes that he is a legitimate and serious leader that people want to follow, it forever changes the way in which she views him. So I'll give it a six out of 10. Lastly, as to the payoff, there's quite a bit of payoff here. Matt had been previously viewed by Tuan as being a useful idiot for the most part. She had scolded him multiple times, talked down to him, and refused to call him by his name. So to see her finally have a different view was quite satisfying. I'll give it an eight out of 10. In total, Tuan seeing Matt for who he is gets a 28 out of 40 and earns the number five spot on my list. Coming in at number four on the list, we have not only one moment, but a set of moments that really mark the beginning of the mat that we know towards the end of the book. In The Dragon Reborn, 
After recovering in the White Tower from his exposure to the Shadar Logoth dagger, Matt gets tasked to deliver a letter to Morghese by Elaine Egwene and Nynaeve. He accepts because they also give him a letter that will allow him to get out of the city, but he realizes he doesn't have any money. Remembering that he was always fairly decent at dice, he goes out into the city to gamble, and that's when he starts winning every hand he bets on. He makes so much money that he's even shocked and leaves some of his winnings at a table. This is the beginning of Matt being the nearly unstoppable force when it comes to games of chance, and it defines his character for the rest of the story. For meaning to the story, this is highly meaningful because it's one of Matt's defining traits in the story. His luck is at the center of almost all of his storylines, including the dice rattling in his head. Eight out of 10 for meaning to the story. As for fun, this was always a fun set of scenes for me to read. I love seeing Matt striking it rich and the genuine surprise on his and everyone else's face when he realizes that he can't lose. It's also very enjoyable to see Matt becoming rich after being a nobody and somebody without power. So for fun, I'll give it a nine out of 10. For emotional weight, this was really the weakest area for this. This is just not an emotional scene. So I'll give it a three out of 10. Lastly, for the payoff, this is big to me. Matt has been a fairly mundane and powerless character up till this point in the story. He was sick for the last two books. He had not had much to show for it other than blowing the horn of Valir. To see him finally begin to achieve power, that's really a great long setup. I'll give it a nine out of 10. In total, Matt's luck coming in gets a 29 out of 40 and earns the number four spot on my list. The biggest moment in the series is arguably the last battle, and Matt Cawthon plays a very large role in that. Matt, who's married to Tuon at this point, is second in command of the Shan Chan army, and as the generals for the, the Light are sabotaged with compulsion from Grendel, Matt is determined to be the safest person to lead the army due to his Foxhead medallion that blocks the one power. After he takes over, he has an outnumbered and outmanned group of forces against Demondred, the Sharan armies, and countless Trollocs. Through skill, manipulating the battlefield, and great timing, Matt is able to orchestrate a victory for the forces of the light and give Rand time to win against the Dark One. For meaning to the story, it is hard to get more meaningful. This is the last battle, and Matt is truly at the center of winning it. Easy 10 out of 10. For fun, I love watching Matt and his unorthodox communication and his style as he takes over. His deception, his knowledge that Mogidian was spying, they're all, it's fun to watch and it's fun to see. I'll give it a nine out of 10. As for emotional weight, again, this isn't really an emotional thing. There is death in the last battle. That's sad, but it isn't really tied to Matt being in charge. I'll give it a two out of 10. Lastly, for the strong setup and payoff, this is also a very high score. This was essentially set up gradually for the entirety of the story. Matt's battle prowess and ability to command had been hinted at, and finally we get to see him command the largest army in the world. I'll give it a nine out of 10. In total, Matt taking over the last battle gets a 30 out of 40 and earns the number three spot on my list. We're finally here, the top two. And for the number two spot, we have Matt bowing to Egwene in Saladar. Right after Egwene was brought to Saladar and raised to be Omerlin, she was being undermined at every turn and not receiving respect from the Aes Sedai that raised her. After Matt shows up with his army to bring her back to Rand and he meets her and he sees what's happening, he makes a scene as he leaves and he bows to her, giving her the full respect that would be due to the Yamerlin seat and implying that he is there at her service with a large army, which builds her standing and demonstrates that even though Matt was trying to take her away and not really respecting her as the Yamerlin to her face, he realized that he would always have the back of his friend and somebody from the two rivers. For meaning to the story, this isn't super meaningful in the sense to the whole span of the series, but it is meaningful to Egwene and to give her rise as a powerful Omerlin and the leader of the Aes Sedai. So I'll give it a six out of 10. For fun, not necessarily a fun scene, but I do enjoy it as it does demonstrate who Matt's is as a character. And he's trying to show up the other disrespectful Aes Sedai, which I always love. So six out of 10. For emotional weight, this is one of the stronger scenes in the book for that. The way that Matt intentionally shows immense respect publicly for Egwene when she needs it, and he didn't have to, shows the bond that they share and the real friendship they developed over their childhood in the Two Rivers. This is really who Matt is at his core, and it's one of my favorite Matt moments. I'll give this one a 10 out of 10 for emotional weight. For payoff, again, a super high score from me. The reason the payoff went so well was that Egwene was struggling to gain respect, and Matt had just disrespected her in private by not listening to her, that she was the Omerlin, in fact. And it wasn't until Matt noticed that she needed his help that he realized the situation and acted accordingly. 
I thought the setup and the situation made it more impactful. Give it a nine out of 10. In total, Matt bowing to Egwene gets a 31 out of 40 and earns the number two spot on my list. Coming in at number one on the list is a massive moment from Towers of Midnight, Matt rescuing Moraine from the land of the Finns. This is a huge moment in so many ways. Matt, along with Jane Farstrider and Tom, they enter the Tower of Genji. Through a combination of both cunning and fighting skill, they're able to rescue Moraine and escape with her, despite losing Noel in the fight. For meaning to the story, Moraine plays a pivotal role in the last battle and in getting the different factions to unite and helping also Rand at Shea Ghoul. While she wasn't completely instrumental, she was very important to the success of the last battle, so I'll give it a seven out of 10. For fun, this isn't my favorite Matt scene to read just for the fun of it. It's exciting, but it doesn't come across as fun in the same way that Galad and Gawain getting their asses kicked did, for example. That being said, it is still fun, and it's still fun seeing the freaky world of the Finns. I'll give it a 6 out of 10. For emotional weight, this is where it truly hits home. From losing Noel to a sacrifice, to seeing Moraine helpless, to Tom finally being reunited with Moraine, this scene had a lot of emotional weight behind it. I'll give it a 9 out of 10. Lastly, for payoff. This is an off-the-charts payoff. We had teases of Moraine being alive all the way back to the fires of heaven, and hints from then on. So to see this finally happen, and in such a dramatic way, it really hits the right notes to pay off such a long setup. Easy 10 out of 10. In total, Matt rescuing Moraine gets a 32 out of 40 and earns the number one spot on my list. So that's my list of the top 10 Matt Cawthon moments. Do you agree with my list? What would yours be? Let me know in the comments of the video. Also, like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. Remember also to sign up for WatCon if you aren't already signed up because it's coming soon in July and ticketing is going to close for in-person tickets very soon. More information at WatCon.com. Huge thank you to my patrons for your support of the channel and of the content. If you want to support the channel, consider checking out my Patreon link. That link is in the description of the video. Lastly, if you liked this video, you would probably like one of these here as well. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Peace out.